Now, when it comes to AP exam scores and doing well on the AP exam, there's just one thing that you need to know. Your score on the AP exam very much depends on how hard you work in the next couple of weeks. So it doesn't matter if you spent this school year in person, virtual, or some combination. It doesn't matter who your teacher was this year. It doesn't matter if you were an amazing student or a terrible student. What does matter is that you buckle down and you get focused over the next couple of weeks. And this is exactly what we are gonna help you do in the next two weeks with AP Daily Live Review for AP Statistics. So let's go ahead and jump right into it here. My name is Luke Wilcox. I am a teacher at East Kentwood High School in Kentwood, Michigan. Shout out to all my Falcons in my AP Statistics classes. Uh, we are uh, proud to be the number one most diverse public high school in the state of Michigan. I've spent my entire teaching career there of 20 years, 16 of which I have been teaching AP statistics. Uh, in addition to that, I have also been an AP exam grader every summer for the last eight summers. So I'm hoping to bring my experience as a teacher and my experience as a grader to these review sessions over the next couple of weeks. Now I'm gonna be joined by my good friend and colleague, Darren Starnes. Darren, could you say hello to everybody? Thank you, Mr. Wilcox, and hello, AP Stat students. Let me add my welcome to AP Daily Live Review for AP Statistics. Uh, as Mr. Wilcox said, I'm Darren Starnes, and I've been teaching AP Statistics since the course started in 1996. I've been fortunate to be an AP exam reader since 1998 and have participated as a question leader where my responsibility was helping to finalize the scoring guidelines for free response questions uh, since 2002. It's a pleasure for me to work with all of you and I'm looking forward to these review sessions. Awesome, thank you, Darren. Lots and lots of good experience that Darren is gonna bring to uh, the table here. So let's start with uh, talking about our overall goals. So when Darren and I first sat down, this was now several months ago to start planning for these sessions here, we decided we wanted to keep it real simple with three overall goals. So the first goal, is we're gonna try and set, uh, simplify some of the challenging content in AP statistics. And the way that we're gonna do that is by using a whole lot of practice questions, all of which come from old AP exams. So we're gonna be doing a lot of multiple choice, a lot of free response, but they are all real AP questions. Uh, and we'll use that to simplify some challenging content. Now, the next thing is we're gonna try and share some uh, strategies for a AP exam success. Now, this is where Darren and I are gonna use our years of teaching experience and our years of grading the AP exam to try and give you some insider information that's gonna help you maximize your score on the AP exam. And then overall, we just wanna try and build your confidence. And I can assure you that if you are with us for the next two weeks and you come to all eight of these review sessions, you can go into that AP exam feeling confident because this is gonna be a, an excellent, excellent review over the next two weeks. So Darren, why don't you give them a little bit of an overview of what the next two weeks is gonna look like? So we have eight sessions to accomplish the goals that Mr. Wilcox just shared. You'll notice that the first four sessions focus on content. So starting today, Mr. Wilcox will be taking you through some of the challenging content and the critical skills for collecting and exploring data. Then tomorrow, I'll jump in uh, with challenging content and critical skills for probability, random variables, and sampling distributions. Back to Mr. Wilcox for session three, inference for categorical data, and then back to me uh, for session four, inference for quantitative data. These are the big units that we uh, wanna be sure you're prepared for in the AP uh, course. And then sessions five through eight focus specifically on AP exam preparation, starting with tools for the test, in session five, rubrics for free response success in session six, taming the investigative task in session seven, and then our favorite, uh, Mr. Wilcox is in my top 10 tips for your success on the AP statistics exam. It's an ambitious agenda, but if you stick with us, we think you'll get everything you need to maximize your performance on this year's AP exam. Awesome. Thank you, Darren. So let's talk through some uh, quick logistics about how this is going to work. Uh, first, 
item of note is that there are handouts to go along with each one of the sessions that you can uh, get from www.tinyurl.com slash AP Statistics 2021 Review. That link is also in the YouTube description down below. Please click that link or type that URL in right now and you're gonna be looking for the session one handout. You're gonna need that for what we're gonna do uh, in this session right here. And what you're gonna find there is you're gonna find a handout for each one of the eight sessions. You're also gonna find the formula sheet and the tables that you will be provided on the AP exam. We're gonna need that as we work through some of the, the problems today. The other thing that I wanna make you aware of is at the end of this session, uh, I am going to ask you for some feedback. We want student feedback. We wanna know how it went. We wanna know how we might be able to change things moving forward. And so I will remind you of this at the end of the session, there is a link that I will send, uh, get you sent to where you can provide us with some feedback. So I think we are ready to jump into session one. So I am going to uh, let Darren go now. Darren, you can be on your way for today. Thanks very much. Uh, hope to see all of you tomorrow and good luck, Mr. Wilcox. Excellent, all right, well, let's start out with a, a, a quick plan, okay? So here is what we are going to do with the session today. And each one of the sessions this week, you're gonna notice has a similar structure here. And the way we're gonna approach it is that we're gonna, uh, we're gonna look at five multiple choice questions, all from previous AP exams. And then we're gonna look at one free response question from a previous exam. And so with these six practice questions, I'm gonna be reviewing content with you, but I'm also going to be trying to give you some specific AP exam strategies that you can use. So I think we are ready to jump into our first practice question. It is a multiple choice. And before we take a look at the question, I'd like you to take a look down here at the bottom of this slide here. Uh, you can see that you can, you, uh, this is gonna be interactive. So I am expecting that you on the other end here, students, you are going to be submitting your answers and I can see those real time in the Google form. And so uh, on the handout that you got, uh, there is a link for each one of the questions, the multiple choice questions that we do today. Or if you want to, you can type this URL into your browser uh, and it should take you to a Google form that will allow you to see this question, multiple choice question number one, and it'll allow you to submit your answer. And so that I can see what students are doing, we can take a look at common student responses, and that will help me on my end in my explanation for when I go through the multiple choice question. So let me go ahead and read off question number one for you. Here's what it says. The distribution of the diameters of a particular variety of oranges is approximately normal with a standard deviation of 0.3 inches. How does the diameter of an orange at the 67th percentile compare with the mean diameter? So I'm gonna take a little bit of a pause right here because I want you to get a chance to try this problem first before we actually talk our way through it. And I am expecting that you'll go to that Google form using the link down below or using the link right in the handout there. And I'm already starting to see some responses come in, but let me just pause right here for about 10 seconds to give you a chance to try this. All right, as my responses start to come in here, let's uh, take a look. It appears that right now answer C is the, is the most chosen answer here. I am seeing quite a few of you saying D and E here. Responses are definitely starting to, uh, to trickle in here. And so uh, it appears as we uh, approach 100 responses here that uh, answer choice C is the most common answer choice. And it looks like second uh, I think answer choice D is coming in a uh, second here. So uh, let's go ahead and actually dig in and take a look at the question and we'll see how well you did on this particular question. So first thing I'm gonna suggest, this is an AP exam strategy, is that when you are doing multiple choice questions, you need to be an active reader. That means you need to engage with the text as you read through it, okay? So I'm gonna try and model that for you here. It says the distribution of the diameters of a particular variety of oranges is approximately normal with a standard deviation of 0 
How does the diameter of an orange at the 67th percentile compare with the mean diameter? So I'm just underlining important information here. And I think the next thing that we wanna do here is we definitely wanna draw a picture just to get an idea of all the information that's given in this problem. Now, I, I am told that this is approximately normal. So I'm gonna draw a normal curve and I'm even gonna label it with a capital N to identify it as approximately normal. And then what I always do in parentheses is I always put the mean and the standard deviation. Now for this problem, we don't know what the mean is. So I'm just gonna use mu, but I do know the standard deviation is 0 0.3. That was given to me in the problem. So the center of this distribution is unknown, that's mu. Now it says that we're looking for the diameter of an orange at the 67th percentile. Now 67th percentile means 67% of the diameters are less than that value. So I know I have to be more than halfway and I don't know exactly where that is, but I'm just gonna guess that maybe it's right about here. And I'm trying to draw that such that this area over here is about 0 0.67. And so we're trying to figure out what is that value that has an area of 0.67 to the left of it. Well, right away, we can take a look at our answer choices here and we can eliminate some of the incorrect answers. I can see very clearly in my picture that we have to be above the mean. And because I see these two answer choices say below the mean, I can throw those out right away. I know the correct answer is not A, I know it's not B. Now, the next thing we wanna think about is this value that we're trying to find right here, uh, how, how, uh, how many standard deviations is it away from the mean or above the mean? And the way that we can answer that question is using table A. Now, this is in the formula sheet that's provided for you here. So this is the exact same formula sheet that you're gonna get on the AP exam. And in addition to all the formulas, you also have this table A. And what table A does is it says for a given z-score, what is the area to the left of that z-score? And you'll notice on the first page of table A, it's all negative z-scores. All those are below the mean. We definitely want the second page of table A because we know we're above the mean here. And what we're looking for is we're looking for an area over here of 0 0.67. And so we're gonna look at the values in the table and try and get as close to 0 0.67 as we can. And actually it turns out 0 0.67 is one of the values that you see in the table there. And it looks like over here on the left, that corresponds to a z-score of 0 0.4 with a hundredth value of 0 0.04. That is a z-score of 0 0.44. Now this is telling me that if I am 0 0.44 standard deviations above the mean, the area to the left of that is about 0.67. So let me go back here. And I know that this has a z-score of 0 0.44. Now that is the z-score. That's not telling you how far it is above the mean. So I think this one could be a, a good distractor. And some of you may have said that. That is incorrect because the z-score is 0 0.44. Now, if we remember the z-score is telling us how many standard deviations above the mean, all we have to do here is take 0.44 standard deviations. Well, we know the standard deviation is 0.3. So if we do 0.44 standard deviations, that's telling me that I am exactly 0.132 inches above the mean. And so the correct answer here is C. And I'm seeing now after 287 responses, uh, that, was, that was the most chosen answer. 58% of you said answer choice C. So nice job if you got that one right. All right, let's go ahead and move to multiple choice question number two. And uh, once again, you're gonna be submitting your answers. There is a different URL that you'll notice down here on the bottom. Uh, you can also once again, follow the link that is in the handout in order to submit your answer. So let me go ahead and read the question to you here. It says the weights of a population of adult male gray whales are approximately normally distributed with a mean weight of 18,000 kilograms and a standard deviation of 4,000 kilograms. The weights of a population of adult male humpback whales are approximately normal with a mean of 30,000 and a standard deviation of 6,000. A certain adult male gray whale weighs 24,000 kilograms. This whale would have the same standardized weight Z-score as an adult male humpback whose weight in kilograms is equal to which of the following? So just as I did for the first one, I am going to pause right here and I'm gonna give you a chance to try this problem on your own before we work through it together as a group. And please submit your answer in the Google form using the link below or using the link that is in the handout.
So let me go ahead and pause here for just a moment. All right, as I take a look at the responses here, there are really only two answer choices that are appearing here so far. It appears that uh, most of you are choosing answer choice E. We've got quite a few, a few votes for D and then much less for the others here. So as these responses start to come in, it appears that answer choices E and D are uh, the top choices of students at this point. So let's go ahead and uh, dig in and we'll see what the actual correct response is on this one here. So once again, I'm going to start by actively reading the question. So I'm going to underline some of the important information here. So we, we start with adult uh, male gray whales, approximately normally distributed with a mean of 18,000 and a standard deviation of 4,000. So I'm actually going to just pause right there to record that information. So for the gray whales, we know that it's approximately normal. So I'm going to use capital N again. We know that the mean is 18,000. And we know that the standard deviation is 4,000. All right, let's continue reading. The weights for adult male humpback whales approximately normally distributed with a mean of 30,000 and a standard deviation of 6,000. So let's go ahead and record that as well. This is for the humpback whales. And once again, for the humpback whales, we're told that they're approximately normal with a mean of 30,000 and a standard deviation of 6,000. Okay, next, a certain adult male gray whale weighs 24,000 kilograms. Okay, so we have a gray whale that weighs 24,000 kilograms. This whale would have the same standardized weight or Z-score as an adult male humpback whale whose weight in kilograms is equal to which of the following? Okay, we need to, we need to get a Z-score here, a standardized score. And so you gotta know the formula for calculating a Z-score is to take whatever your value is and then subtract the mean and then divide by the standard deviation. So let's start with the gray whale that weighs 24,000 kilograms. 24,000 is the actual value. We know that the mean for gray whales is 18,000 and we know the standard deviation is 4,000. So this is gonna give me a z-score of 1.5 and that is positive 1.5. Now this is telling me that that particular gray whale is 1.5 standard deviations above the mean. So what, that, what we need to do next now is we need to find the humpback whale that would have the same standardized score of 1.5 or one and a half standard deviations above the mean. Well, we can eliminate some answers right away because we know the mean here is 30,000. And we are looking for the humpback whale that's one and a half standard deviations above the mean. So anything below 30,000, or even at 30,000 is gonna be gone. So we can eliminate three of the choices there. The only two choices that are actually above the mean are answer choices D and E. Now, if we wanna be exactly one and a half standard deviations above the mean, we would just start out at the mean of 30,000 and then we would add one and a half standard deviations or one and a half times 6,000. And sure enough, this is gonna give us our final answer of 39,000. And so the correct answer here is answer choice E. And just to check in with how we did on that one, after 212 responses, the great percentage of you said answer choice E. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. Uh, nice job on that question there. All right, let's go ahead and move to question number three. Uh, as before, there's a link down here uh, to a Google form. And this is all that, that link is also on the handout, but let's, let's dig into the question here. It says, a high school statistics class wants to conduct a survey to determine what percentage of students in the school would be willing to pay a fee for participating in after school activities. 20 students are randomly selected from each of the freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior classes to complete the survey. This plan is an example of which type of sampling. So I'm gonna give you just a few moments here in order to submit your answers on this one. And then we'll take a look at those as a whole group. So please submit your answers using the Google form.
All right, we are well past the 100 responses here. And it looks like the current leading candidate is answer choice D, followed closely by answer choice A. So D and A appear to be the uh, most commonly chosen answers here. So let's see if we can't decide which one of those is correct here. So uh, we have five choices of different sampling methods here. And I'm gonna start by trying to eliminate some of the ones that I'm pretty sure are not the correct answer here. So if we think about a convenience sample, it has to be something where it's like convenient to use those people as your sample. So maybe this would be like somebody standing at the school early in the morning and just waiting for the first 100 people to arrive. And whoever those first 100 students are, that would be the sample. That would be a convenience sample. That's definitely not what we have described here. And so I'm gonna eliminate answer choice B. The next one I wanna look at is the systematic sample. And uh, the way this one works, uh, for example, you'd have to get a list of all of the students in the school. Maybe you go down to the counseling office, you get an alphabetic list of all the students in the school. You pick a random starting point within that list, and then you go uh, in equal intervals. So maybe you choose every 10th student. So you pick your random starting point, and then the 10 students down, and 10 students down, and 10 students down, until you get your sample size. That's a systematic sample. And that's definitely not what we have described here. And so we are left with cluster, simple random sample, and a stratified random sample. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of a visual for each one of these sampling methods. Uh, the first thing to recognize is that a simple random sample is sometimes referred to as an SRS. And I'm actually going to start by describing that sampling method, okay, with a picture. And here's what the picture looks like. This large cloud that I'm drawing here represents the population. If we were to take a simple random sample from that population, we would hope that that sample that we take is representative of the population. In other words, it looks very similar to the population. So I'm gonna draw a small cloud here because it's representative of the population. That would be a simple random sample. Now, the next sampling method that I'll draw you a picture for here is a stratified random sample. Now, the way this one works is you take that big cloud, you take that whole population, and you split it into strata. And each strata, all of the individuals within that strata have to be somehow similar so that those are homogeneous groups. And what we would do is we would take an SRS from each one of those strata. So that's what a stratified random sample would look like. And then the last one we need to talk about is a cluster sample. And uh, for a cluster sample, you're going to take the population and you're going to break it up into groups again. But this time, each one of the groups should accurately represent the whole population here. So you're going to have heterogeneous groups here. And then once we have all of our clusters, we're going to take a random sample of those clusters, say this cluster and this cluster and this cluster. And then we would sample every single individual within the selected clusters here. So now that we have those three pictures here, when you look back at the question, if we're gonna take 20 students randomly selected from each of the freshman, so sophomore, junior, and senior classes, that is definitely a stratified random sample because each one of the groups, they are similar within each group. All freshmen, all sophomores, all juniors, and all seniors. And we're taking a random sample from each one of those groups. So the correct answer here is definitely D, a stratified random sample. And once again, I think you all have done a fantastic job on this one. 75% of you got that one correct here with 368 responses. Nice work. All right, so let's move to question number four. So I'm gonna go ahead and read the question first. All right, here's what it says. The computer output below shows the result of a linear regression analysis for predicting the concentration of zinc in parts per million from the concentration of lead in parts per million found in fish from a river. So now we have some computer output there. You can see all the values that are given to you in the computer output. And then the question down below says, which of the following statements is a correct interpretation of the value 19.0 that you see in the output? So just as before, I'm going to go ahead and pause right now and give you a chance to try this question on your own before we take a look at it as a whole group.
Okay, lots to read in this question. So the responses are coming in just a little bit slower here, but we do have the two leaders out in front, answer choice B, and it looks like answer choice A. So I do think that we've, uh, we are, most of us are guessing A or B on this one. Uh, a few votes for D in there. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at the question and see if we can come up with the correct answer on this one. All right, lots to review in this question here. All right, the first thing is, is that when you get this computer output, you have to know what each one of the numbers represents in the computer output. And so remember back that when you are trying to find the equation for the line of best fit or the least squares regression line, typically in AP statistics, we're gonna represent that as y hat equals a plus bx. So the a value is the y-intercept and the b is the slope. So looking at the computer output here, you have to know that this first constant, 16.3, that you see in there, that's the A value. And then the, the value below that is the B value or the slope. So if we wanted to write the equation for the least squares regression line here, it says that the response variable is zinc. So what we are trying to predict is the zinc level. And we know that's gonna be equal to A, which is 16.3 plus B, which is 19.0, uh, times the lead, the lead value. So that's the equation that we would use to try and predict zinc if we knew the level of lead. But this question in particular is about this B value of 19.0. And because that's attached to the X variable, we know that that is the slope. So let's talk just a little bit about slope. And slope in your algebra class was the change in Y over the change in X. Now, in this context, when we say change in Y, that's actually the change in the predicted zinc level over the change in X, which is the change in lead. Now, if we think about that 19.0 as being 19.0 over one, you can see very clearly here that the 19 corresponds to the change in the zinc level and the one corresponds to the change in the lead level. So it's saying if the lead level changes by one, we would predict the zinc level to change by 19. And that is a positive 19, which would mean that it would go up. So let's go ahead and look at the answer choices and see which one is worded correctly. Okay, answer choice A. On average, there is a predicted increase of 19 in concentration of lead for every increase of one in concentration of zinc. Well, that sounds good. It sounds like an interpretation of slope, but the two variables have been switched around. They are in the incorrect order here. And so answer choice A is incorrect. Now B says, on average, there is a predicted increase of 19.0 in the concentration of zinc for every increase of one in the concentration of lead. Well, that's exactly what we're looking for right there. So answer choice B is, is our correct answer. But hold on, we don't wanna quit yet. One AP exam uh, tip that I'm gonna give you is that you should always read all of the answers just in case maybe we missed something. So let's take a look. C says the predicted concentration of zinc is 19 in fish with no concentration of lead. D says almost the same, but they've switched around lead and zinc. Now those two to me sound like what they're trying to interpret the y-intercept. That's definitely not an interpretation of slope. So I know those are incorrect. And then answer choice E says approximately 19% of the variability in zinc is predicted by its linear relationship with lead concentration. Well, that sounds like they're trying to interpret the R squared value. That's not what we're looking for in this question here. So the correct answer on this one is B. And as I can see here in the Google form, you all did a pretty nice job with that. Although A looked like a pretty good distractor and that's because the two variables were switched. Okay, let's go ahead and jump into question number five, our last multiple choice question here for today. And here's what it says. The manager of a public swimming pool wants to compare the effectiveness of two laundry detergents, detergent A and detergent B, in cleaning the towels that are used daily. As each dirty towel is turned in, it is placed into the only washing machine on the premises. When the washing machine contains 20 towels, the manager flips a coin to determine whether detergent A or B will be used to that load. The cleanliness of the towels is rated on a scale of one to 10 by a person who does not know which detergent was used. The manager continues this experiment for many days. Which of the following best describes the manager's study? So just as before, 
I'm going to give you just a few moments here to submit your answers in the Google form uh, before we take a look at this question as a whole group. Well, I will tell you this question has me very worried because there is a big split on what we think the correct answer is here. Uh, all five of the answer choices are getting chosen. I guess it looks like B is currently in the lead, uh, but I'm, I am definitely a little bit concerned about this one because of the variety of answers that we are seeing on this one. So uh, let's see if we can't figure this one out here. All right. So we have five different answer choices there. And once again, I'm going to try and eliminate uh, some of the ones that I don't think are going to work. And I'm going to start here with answer choice E, which says observational study. Now, remember, an observational study is where the researcher is simply just collecting data from something that's already happening. The researcher is not imposing a treatment. OK, if we're imposing a treatment, then it becomes an experiment. Well, we definitely have an experiment here because we're uh, using detergent A and detergent B as the treatment. So because a treatment is being imposed, this is definitely an experiment. It is not an observational study. So I can go ahead and get rid of that answer choice. Now, the remaining answer choices I think are very tricky, but there's one thing that might help us here in deciding what's the correct answer. And that's to think about what is the experimental unit in this experiment. And I know a lot of you might say, well, it's the towels. You know, each towel gets randomly assigned to the two different treatments. Well, it's not actually the towels. It's a load of 20 of the towels that's being randomly assigned to detergent A or detergent B. So let's think of the loads of 20 towels as being the experimental unit. Now, if we look at answer choice D, it says matched pairs with detergent A and B as the pair. Well, in order to get matched pairs, you have to have pairs of experimental units. So we'd have to have pairs of loads here, or each one of the loads would have to receive both treatments. Now, we definitely don't have loads of laundry here that are getting both detergent A and detergent B. We're definitely not pairing loads together. So this is not a matched pairs design. Now, the next thing that I notice here is that B and C are both referring to a block design. So if you have an experiment, with a block design, you would use that when you think that there is some other variable for the experimental unit that might impact the results or impact the response variable. And uh, let's see, answer choice C is trying to say that detergent A and B are the blocks. Well, those are the treatments in the experiment here. Those are definitely not the blocks. And then answer choice C is trying to say that the washing machine is a block, but there's only one washing machine. It's the only washing machine uh, on the premises. So definitely not a block design. And so by eliminating all of the, the process of elimination here, I've actually landed on answer choice A, which is a completely randomized design. And one way I like to think about that is by drawing a, a diagram. So you've got your experimental units of these loads of laundry and maybe say there's, he does this for a hundred days. The first thing that we do with those experimental units is we do random assignment. And this is where they get randomly assigned to the treatment. And the treatment is either gonna be detergent A or detergent B. And then after they're given detergent A and B, they're gonna be washed. And then in the end, we're gonna compare how uh, clean they are. So we're gonna compare the cleanliness. So this diagram that you see here, this is a diagram for a completely randomized design, which is what we have here. And after 367 responses, I do think that, uh, oh no, we, we chose answer choice B. Okay, this is not a block design. So this is one that I'm very glad that we chose to go over. Uh, the correct answer here was definitely A, a completely randomized design. All right, well, nice work with those uh, multiple choice. Very, very well done. Uh, but we are ready now to move into the other type of question that you're gonna see on the AP exam, which of course is a free response question. So let's go ahead and dive into this free response. Here's what it says. Records are kept by each state in the United States on the number of pupils enrolled in public schools and the number of teachers employed by public schools for each school year. 
From these records, the ratio of the number of pupils to the number of teachers, the PT ratio, can be calculated for each state. The histograms below show the PT ratio for every state in the 2001-2 school year. The histogram on the left displays the ratios for the 24 states that are west of the Mississippi. I'm gonna record that there, 24 states west of the Mississippi. And the histogram on the right displays the ratios for the 26 states that are east of the Mississippi. So over here, we have 26 states that are represented. So very clearly, we've got some nice looking histograms. It's giving us the ratio of the number of pupils to the number of teachers for the two different sets of, of states. All right, now here's the first question. The first question says, describe how you would use the histograms to estimate the median, we're looking for a median, PT ratio for each group, west and east of states. Uh, then use this procedure to estimate the median of the west group and the median of the east group. So let's go ahead and start with the west group. And we know from the previous page that there are 24 states that are west of the Mississippi. So we have 24 values represented in that histogram. So let's think about the median here. We know the median is the middle value, but because there's an even number of values, we're not actually gonna have an exact middle value. We're gonna have to go between two values. And in this case, we're gonna have to go between the 12th and the 13th values, if we had those values listed in order from smallest to largest. Well, they are sort of listed smallest to largest in the histogram here. So let's look at each one of the bars in the histogram. I notice in that first bar that there's just one in that 12 to 13 uh, uh, bar. But then in the 13 to 14 bar, we have four, and it looks like the next one has six, and the next one has three, and the next one has two, and so on. But if we're going in order from smallest to largest, we need to just figure out where the 12th and 13th values are. So if I start in just that first bar there, that is all the values that are now less than 13. And there's only one of them in that bar. If I add the second bar in, I'm now trying to total up how many states there are that are less than 14. And I'm going to do the one plus the four. That's going to give me a total of five. Now we add in the next value, which is gonna give me all of the states that are less than 15. So now it's one plus four plus six, and that's gonna give me uh, 11. Now I'm still not yet to the median. Remember the median is between the 12th and 13th values. Well, I'm gonna guess it's probably gonna come in this next bar here. Between 15 and 16, we have three more to add on. That gets me to the 14th value. Now this means that the 12th and the 13th values are in this bar right here. And so our answer here is that the median has to be between 15 and 16 for the states that are in the West. Now we're gonna have to do this exact same thing over here in the East, but this time we now have 26 values. And if we have 26 values, that means that the median is gonna be between the 13th and the 14th values. So just as we did uh, before, we're gonna have to start adding these up. We've got two and then four and then four, and then it looks like 11 there. And I'm gonna do the same thing over here. How many less than 13, 14, 15, and 16? And uh, that first bar has two. If we take the first two bars, two plus four is gonna give me six. First three bars, two plus four plus four is gonna give me 10. And then if we take all four bars, now we're up to 21. Well, the 13th and 14th values definitely are gonna be in this tall bar right here, which looks to be the same as for the West, which is that the median is gonna be between 15 and 16. So that takes care of part A. Let's go ahead and take a look at part B. Part B says write a few sentences comparing the distribution of PT ratios for states in the two groups. Okay, very, very important here. You're being asked to compare distributions. It is very common on the AP exam that you will be asked to describe a single distribution or to compare two distributions. And you have to know what's gonna be expected on the rubric here. And it's been very clear over the years of the AP exam that the things that you need to include here are shape, outliers, center, and variability. And if you look at the first letter, the first letter in each one of those words, 
uh, you can use the acronym SOCV to help you remember the four things that have to be included. But I'm going to add something else on here. It's that you have to include context of the question as well. All right. And in addition to that, because this is asking you to compare, you have to make sure that you use comparative language. And when I say comparative language, you want to use words like less than, greater than, similar to, different from. So let's take a look at the model response and see if we can find all of these components in the model response. So here's the model response. Let's read through it. And what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to make sure that we have all four of these components plus context. So here's what it says. The shapes of the two histograms are different. The histograms for states that are west of the Mississippi is unimodal and skewed to the right, whereas the histogram for states that are east of the Mississippi is unimodal and nearly symmetric. Okay, that is definitely addressing the shape of both of the distributions. Let's keep reading. As noted in part A, the medians of the two distributions are about the same between 15 and 16 for both distributions. Well, median is a measure of center, so we've definitely addressed the center of both of the distributions. Let's keep reading. The histograms also show that there's more variability in the PT ratios for states that are west of the Mississippi. Although the greatest and least values for each group are not known, the range can be approximated. The range for the west is at most 10. The range for the east is at most 7. Well, range is definitely a measure of variability here, so we have taken care of variability. Now, what's missing is outliers, but I think that's okay here because if you look at those histograms, there's not any obvious outliers there, so we don't have to make reference to that. But now let's check for context, okay? Context is where you're giving some idea about what these numbers represent. And you can see it very early in the solution here, the histogram for states that are west of the Mississippi River. There's some context right there. But actually, I might even want a little bit more context. Like, what is this the distribution of? What is the variable that we're measuring? And what we're actually measuring here is the ratio of the number of pupils to the number of teachers. So I would say the histogram of ratio of the number of pupils to the number of teachers for states that are west of the Mississippi River. And that definitely takes care of context. And once you've taken care of context once in your solution, you don't necessarily have to continue to use context over and over again, as long as it's included somewhere in your response. Now, the other thing that we need to check for is comparative language. Did we use comparative language in this response here? Well, we did in a couple of places. In the shape, we said that the shapes are different. That's comparing the shapes. For the medians, we said that the medians are about the same. That's comparative language. And let's see, for the variability, uh, it says that there is more variability for the states that are west of the Mississippi. That's comparative language. So there are three different places there where we've used comparative language. That would be good enough for full credit on this one. All right, there is a final part C here. It says, use your answers in part A and B. Explain uh, how you think the mean, okay, now we're talking about the mean PT ratio uh, during the school year will compare for the two groups. Okay, remember what we said in part A, we said that we thought that the median for each one of them was in the same bar, it was between 15 and 16, right? So we thought that the medians for these two distributions were gonna be pretty close together. But the other thing that we found in part B when we talked about the shape was that the distribution for the West is skewed to the right. And one of the things we know about skewed right distributions is it's gonna pull the mean towards the right such that the mean is greater than the median. So we know that the mean is probably gonna be a little bit greater than that 15 to 16. Now over here on the right with the East, because this is fairly symmetric, we know that for fairly symmetric distributions that the mean is about equal to the median. Well, listen, if the mean has to be a little bit further to the right here, but it's the same here, that would tell us that the mean for the West is gonna be greater than the mean for the east. Now, while this is the correct answer right here, it is not enough to just give the correct answer. You also have to have an explanation. You need to clearly communicate your understanding. So here's what a model solution would look like. It says the medians 
of the two distributions are about the same as determined in part A. The distribution of PT ratios, notice there that we've got our context. I like that there's context in the solution that are west of the Mississippi is skewed to the right, indicating that the mean will probably be higher than the median. The rough symmetry for the east indicates that the mean will be close to the median. Thus, and here's our answer, the mean for the west will be greater than the mean for the east. Okay, so that takes care of our free response question. And let's do, let's do a quick summary of hopefully what you learned today in today's session. So I'm gonna go back to the three goals from the beginning of the session. The first one was to simplify challenging content. So a quick review of what we talked about. We talked about z-scores and using table A when you have normal distributions, but also using the formula for z-scores. We talked about sampling methods, a lot of different sampling methods. And we also talked a little bit about experimental design. Next, we talked about computer output. You gotta know how to read computer output. And that whole idea of interpreting slope, it almost always appears on the AP exam in some fashion. You gotta know how to interpret slope. Next, we talked about what's needed when you are comparing distributions of quantitative data. And this, of course, is where we came up with the acronym SOCV plus context, and also, of course, making sure that you use comparative language. Up next, let's talk about our second goal, which is what are some strategies that you should be using for AP exam success? And we went through several of them. The first one is that you want to read actively, which means you're marking up the question as you read it underlining, circling, summarizing what you see in the question. Next, you wanna make sure that you can eliminate obvious incorrect answers. So this would be for multiple choice. A lot of times there's a couple of answers you can get rid of right away. Next, uh, make sure that you read all of the answer choices. Even if you think you found the one that is the correct answer, reading the other ones will sometimes make you aware of something that you might've missed. Next, Especially when it comes to free response, you got to know what is needed for full credit. If the question asks to compare distributions, you got to know what's expected in order to compare distributions. And then always include context. Anywhere you can sneak context in in the free response, you want to include that. It always shows up somewhere in the rubrics for the AP exam. And then finally, I hope that we're starting to build your confidence here after one session. Uh, and, and definitely, I know that you'll be feeling more confident by the time that we get to the end of these two weeks here. Now, I mentioned this at the beginning, but we do want your feedback. I want to hear from students. So I'm going to ask my students tomorrow in class how things went today, but I also want to know from you how things went. So there is a link here to give me some feedback. This link is also contained at the bottom of the handout that you've been using with the questions on it. Please give me some feedback. Let me know what worked, what didn't work. Love to, uh, to hear from you. Uh, also, if you could give me a thumbs up on YouTube down there, that would be great. I think this will help us to get the message out to more and more AP Stats students so that we can help as many AP Stats students as possible. So please give me a thumbs up if this uh, session was helpful to you. So this is Luke Wilcox signing off for today. Tomorrow you'll be joining Darren Starnes and then I will be back again to see you on Wednesday. Thanks, thanks so much.